we will, we will officially get started. Uh, I'm going to ask you all to stand, and we, as we do in all uh, workshops and city meetings, start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask the Chief of Police if he would lead us accordingly. Thank you. If everybody can face the flag, uh, place your right hand over your heart, please, and I pledge allegiance to the flag. I'm Stephen Johnson, the city manager, and we want to welcome you to this workshop uh, and to this very informative uh, workshop uh, put on by Councilwoman Keys. Uh, before we do get started, I want to take the opportunity to uh, to those that may or may not know uh, mm -hmm. Councilwoman Carol Keys sitting here at the podium. Um, we also ca have Councilman Philip Bienname, uh sitting here uh, to my left, to your right. Thank him for being here. And as other council members come in, we will take the time to introduce them accordingly. Um, we have our chief of police here, Mark Elias, our deputy uh, city manager, Dr. Lemaine Claude, and we also have our city attorney, Regine Monacine, uh who is also sitting up, and we are uh, glad to see Councilwoman uh, Elaine Sterl, uh, who just came in as well. Uh, the purpose of tonight's workshop, um, as indicated so clearly on the flyer, is to address and to hear uh, issues and concerns uh, regarding code enforcement. Uh, first of all, we're glad that um, members of our council uh, have scheduled this and Councilwoman Keys saw the opportunity to uh, invite the public to hear from you as we are moving forward to try to tighten up uh, some of our laws so that we can have better code enforcement. So with that being said, I'm going to get out of the way. We do have staff here tonight um, who's going to take notes, uh, who's going to hear the concerns. Our city attorney is going to uh, jot a lot of information down. Uh, we do have some things in the background that we have been working on um, to, to tighten up our, our grip, but before we get to those final phases, we thought it would be very important uh, through Councilwoman Keys to hear from the general public. So I'm going to introduce her to if she has any other comments, and from there she will uh, start the forum. Thank you, Mr. Manager, for allowing this to happen. Uh, staff has been very uh, wonderful in helping me put this together. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight, joining us uh, to help rewrite our code compliance laws. It's very important. I want to thank our city attorney, Regine Monestine, who has been working on these revisions for just about a year now. And I thank her for including me in the process of reviewing these laws with her. I also want to thank uh, thanks Chief Elias and the entire Code Enforcement Unit who are here tonight with us. So I appreciate your input and being here. Um, I also want to thank our council members, uh, Councilman Bieberdeme and Councilwoman Sterl for joining us. I know the mayor's out of town, and I'm not sure if Mr. Galvin will be joining us later. Um, they also want to hear what is important to the citizens uh, for our entire city. This is not about District 2. It's not about any particular side, it's the entire city we want to clean up. Our code laws are written to provide the residents with safety, security, and a clean environment. That's the purpose of our laws. I first met with Chief Elias and Major Burden just about a year ago, um, before I was elected, to discuss code compliance throughout the city. Uh, there were changes we really felt needed to be made. Uh, the result of that meeting uh, with staff is that our code, and our code compliance laws really needed a change. Uh, what we heard from the uh, code officers is we did not have teeth in our laws. So we have been working on changing our laws, addressing things that are 
current now, getting rid of things that don't uh, come into place anymore, and to give us the teeth and the power that we can enforce them once we cite those issues. Uh, last month, our council voted to um, approve new procedural laws. I wanted to wait, but I wanted to get this moving. Uh, in December, we met with staff, the attorneys, and we have rewritten the minimum housing chapter five laws. Those are posted on the city website. This applies to the apartment building owners and keeping and and renters. Uh, the revised vision um, version is on the website. You can go to the um, website where it says the code compliance workshop, and you will see it. You can see what we've changed. And if you have any questions, tonight's not the last time you can make an input, but I wanted us all together. Uh, We're going to be starting to revise Chapters 10, which, we've, which deals with junked, wrecked, abandoned, and stolen property. That's your abandoned cars, any other kind of junk, pods, rentals, um, junk on your property. And a copy of that is also posted on the website, along with Chapter 12, dealing with nuisances. And these are your barking dogs, your noises, um, smells, anything. But I think we need to elaborate on that. And the reason I've asked everybody, invited you all here tonight, is I would like to know, staff wants to know, what it is that you feel is a problem with the city, or what could use some work. Um, staff is is in the city, but we live here. We all have our pet peeves. I've been speaking to a lot of people over the year. Everybody has something different. Uh, lady I spoke to last um, the other day, she can't make it, but she said, well, spikes on the fence. Of course, that's the most obvious. I would never have thought of spikes. So all of you have different things that bother you that you feel should be cleaned up. So we are going to be listening to you tonight. Um, this is not going to be a question and answer session. There's going to be no debate. Uh, this is going to be like a citizen's forum. I'm going to invite everyone to come up and, sp and speak. <laughs> I'm getting <laughs> something. Um, you're all going to be invited to speak. I'd like you to try to keep your comments to about three minutes. We don't have a huge audience, so if we have time, you know, a, an additional second thought, maybe if you think of something for a minute. But uh, we want to hear you. Uh, we're not going to put any of our staff on the spot. Can you do this? Can you do that? Because we might be changing it anyway. So please, we're going to be taking notes on all of your comments, and we're going to try to incorporate all of your suggestions into the new revisions. And feel free to contact me at the city. Most of you have my email, my phone number or send me a list of items that are um, many concerns you have. So we're going to be taking notes on everything you say tonight. And many people have asked, I'm going to say it now, I'll say it again, the hotline, if you have questions and it's on the papers being handed out, the information, 305-895-9832. You can always call the police, but the hotline is 305 895-9832. You'll see the hours of our code enforcement is seven days a week, early morning to late evening. The enforcement officers are always out there. And I want to thank the chief for being here and helping us with this. I don't think you want to say anything. So I'm going to open this up to the residents. We want to hear you. And I also am going to introduce uh, Mr. McDermott. He is the past chair of the Code Enforcement Board of the City of North Miami for many years. He is running out of here and he wanted to just uh, make a couple comments. Also, I would really appreciate if you would sign in. There's a sign-in sheet out there. I'd love to know who is here, who cares, so we can keep you up to date on what we're doing. And if we have any more revisions, I can maybe send you copies of what we're doing. Uh, a legible email would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilwoman Keys and staff and everyone. Um, you know, th this has been something that people have been talking about for a long time. So I want to thank the city for putting on this workshop. I think it's a, it's a great idea. Um, because I was with the Code Enforcement Board for so many years, um, I guess it's natural for people to call me about the fact that um, 
many citizens on the west side of town and the east side have called me in reference to bringing back the code enforcement board um, there's a great feeling out there that the bringing back the code enforcement board um, is going to enhance the code enforcement efforts um, in the city uh, when the code enforcement board was in existence it com it was composed of members citizens citizens of this city uh, who were appointed by each and every council person here uh, in the city um, each individual became the council person's representative um, not only on the code enforcement board but in many ways became the council's watchdogs their personal watchdogs um, on what was going on in the city and what was happening etc Another advantage of the Code Enforcement Board was that they took a great deal of time and pains to try and work with the citizens who came before them. And I might add here that um, the citizens had a choice at one point in time either to appear before the Special Magistrate or to appear before the Code Enforcement Board. And many people, many people, used to choose the code enforcement board because it was a board of their peers it was people they could relate to it was people that they felt that they could get a better shake with in some ways and help members of the code enforcement board spent many hours I think one of them is here tonight also um, Ms. Burdick was here and I uh, and I think sh she was on the board and I know that the code enforcement board spent um, a great deal of time working with the citizens that came before them um, and also the Code Enforcement Board became a conduit for a lot of the issues um, that were happening in the city as far as code enforcement. As a matter of fact, several Code Enforcement Board workshops similar to this one came about only because of the insistence of the Code Enforcement Board. Um, so, as I say, many people feel that in many ways, the Code Enforcement Board was the voice of the people. It was responsive to the people. Um, it was composed of people who lived here, who wanted to work with the people um, here in our community. And in many ways, were the watchdogs trying to see what was going on in the various neighborhoods that they represented and the council persons that they represented. So I just wanted to, as I say, several people, well, more than several, um, have called me over the past few months saying that bringing back the Code Enforcement Board, they felt, was going to enhance even more so um, the Code Enforcement efforts in the city like it did before. And actually, in moving it, if, as far as cost goes, I think whatever cost is associated is well worth it. Um, as far as the look and appearance and the enforcement of the code uh, within the city. And I think one of our former uh, finance people figured out that if we move the meeting just a half an hour, that the cost savings were such that it wouldn't really be a financial burden on the city and would provide an extra, um, uh, an, an extra um, vehicle for uh, the enforcement of the codes and also for the people um, who were seeking to remedy the uh, uh, situations that they had in reference to uh, code violations. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Ms. McDermott. Um, and I hope you all are here to speak and give us your opinions. And please just come up and if you'd give your name, I don't know if an, ad an address would be helpful if you had it. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman Keys and everybody else that's here. My name is Gail Kornblum. I live at 12785 Maple Road. Um, I have a house directly across the street from me that is a rental property, a short-term rental property. I know it is on the list of one of the ones that is grandfathered in, but there's a problem several times when the house is, is rented. Every once in a while, there's a good tenant who's in and out in a few days. But very frequently, it's a very large group of very young people, uh, glass 
bottles being broken in the street, garbage never put out, and we all take turns moving those garbage pails. Uh, the owner is very nice and he does respond to us when we call him. But I sure I know that in our area there are no other short-term rentals except for this handful that have been legitimate uh, short-term rentals except for the handful that have been grandfathered in. And I was wondering if there's any way to put a term limit or a, a length of time at which point their uh, provision for short-term rentals could be disallowed going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Councilman Keyes. My name is Karen Francis. I live at 12580 Griffin Boulevard. And, you know, I have been around the city a long time. I was born in Miami, and I look at other, other parts of Dade County where, you know, the streets and the roads and the homes look better, and I make certain observations about why my area doesn't look good. And so these are some of the things I've thought of that may or may not have to do with code enforcement. There are boarded up occupied homes. When folks go to Home Depot and there's a storm warning and they buy the big plywood and they board up the house, there are, I can think of three off the hand that have been boarded up for years and people live there. I think that there should be a rule against you keeping the boards up on your windows and doors after there's a hurricane warning. Uh, the other thing is, hold on, because I have this on my phone. Uh, parking on the grass in yards and on the swales. If you look at 127th Street between Northeast 6th Avenue and Griffin, there's all sorts of rocky swales there. There's no grass because those areas are constantly being parked on with cars. And there's a house directly across the street from me. I don't know if there are 15, 20, 30 people living there, but there's about six cars parked on the grass in the yard. I don't think people should be able to park on the grass in unpaved areas. This is my thought. I also agree about bringing back the code enforcement board. When I first moved here 12 years ago and there was a code enforcement board, there seemed to be better code enforcement than there is now. And I have to believe that part of that is because we don't have a, a code enforcement board. Two other things. I think that people who have chain link fences can't replace chain link fences. I don't think you can put in a chain link fence new now in your front yard, but I think if you have a chain link fence, it can't be replaced with a chain link fence. And I wonder if it's possible that leases of single family homes need to be registered with the city. Because I echo the concerns of the previous uh, neighbor that there are people that come in three or four months, they leave trash, they don't care about the property. Maybe if these leases had to be registered with the city of North Miami somehow, that might put a, a, an added burden on a, on a land, <coughs> landlord. Those were my thoughts. Thank you. Chief? Thank you. I have a dissertation like a Sermon on the Mount. My name is Kenneth H. and I've lived in the city since 1971. Used to be your illustrious police chief. And then I had the good fortune of going up to Illinois where I had the pleasure of having code enforcement put into the police department up there like we have now. And I've seen a marked improvement in our code enforcement in the last year. One of the things that I think should happen with code enforcement is my big concern is apartment buildings and the slumlords that own them. And they should be put out of business. This just didn't happen in the last five years or the last ten years. This nonsense with these bums has been going back to 1980. And all of a sudden, one day, we wake up and we say, what happened to our city? How come it looks like this? I can remember taking the old mayor, Mayor Howard New, out on the street with me when I was a lieutenant and showing him some of these dumps on Northeast 6th Avenue. And I find that absolutely appalling. And I think, first of all, if I may, Chief, City Manager, 
I think there should be a reorganization of code enforcement. Sergeant Blanchard is doing a great job. But when you call, and I can, I'm concerned with the apartments. I walk, I walk every day. I do about six miles a day. I see these decrepit dumps, the garbage overflowing from the dumpsters. That, that they don't sweep up after themselves. Trash laying out on the street. Dog defecation all over the place. Graffiti all over the place. And so when you call, you go to code enforcement, they tell you, well, that's minimum housing. Or if I call the sanitation inspector, and I say, please, do something with this. It's reoccurring. And it goes on that week in, week out, year in, year out. I got people dumping on 16th Avenue. I got people dumping on Arch Creek. So write them tickets. Do something. Okay? It should all be reorganized under the police department. The sanitation inspector, minimum housing. You now have animal control, code enforcement. And if I'm not mistaken, the city attorney is working on something I had up in Illinois, rental inspections. Before you rent a house, before you rent an apartment, and I own three apartments. I would live in any one of my apartments. I find the slumlord is just as despicable as a dope dealer. The both purviers of misery and degradation. So one of the things that I'd like to see happen here is rental inspections. Uh, and we pay for it as a landlord. Before I could rent that apartment, you charge me 50 bucks, the city sets the standards, you come in and you check it out. That's what we did in Bolingbrook. I didn't have none of this nonsense and I had a city three times as large as this city. Didn't have any of this crap. And one of the things I would do, Chief, if I may, I'm not trying to tell you how you run your department, but in the community policing venue, if we're going to go to rental inspections, I would train all my community-based police officers in minimum housing. I would retrain everybody in minimum housing, but I would put it under Sergeant Blanchard. He's doing a great job, and I think that's what we need. You know, when you call, you want to go to one complainant. I don't want to be directed to the sanitation inspector, to the animal control. All well, you have that now, animal control under you, or minimum housing. It's, it's very confusing to the citizen. And the things that I see out there, I remember one day, a couple of years ago, I go in to complain about the railroad tracks. And I was told by the person there, this is going back about three or four years ago, and that gentleman has since left, the, the head of that department, the code enforcement department. But I was told to call the railroad. What kind of crap is that? That railroad needs to be cleaned. All that trash should be cleaned up over there. I mean, you see this day in and day out. One of the other things that I would do with the apartments or anybody moving into the city, we give them a welcome package. And we explain to them the do's and the don'ts. You walk your dog, you pick up the defecation. No pit bulls in the city. All right? No trash laying out there. You put your trash out on a certain day, not two weeks ahead of time and leaving it out there. No abandoned cars. No cars parked on, on your grass. Now, we have an ordinance coming up. I think it's uh, on the land use ordinance that any rental property has to have paved driveways. That's going to be coming up shortly, I believe. I think it was when uh, we had it, it was a seven-year push out from the date of that ordinance. And I think that's something that we should enforce. I, I, I drive around and, and, and I see the appalling situation. And it's like shoveling sand against the sea. You know, you go out there, you issue a ticket, and the same son of a gun comes out there and he does the same garbage. One of the things I would also do, Chief, if I could, and I'm just throwing this out there, we got constant dumping on Arch Creek Road. The sanitation inspector, I call her, and, and, and it's the same continuous problem. Why don't we get some pole cams, put them up there, and see if we can catch some of these bums? The graffiti, let's get a contractor and have them come in there within 24 hours and get the graffiti off the wall. I did that in Illinois. I didn't have a problem with that. The graffiti is all over the place. Sharpen carts. Abandoning, the other thing that I see around the city, abandoning telephones, public telephones, abandoned. Just laying out there, crappy. Uh, it, it, it's, it's absolutely disgraceful. And the other thing that I, the clean team, the clean team, we have a clean team that we have under our community uh, redevelopment. Why don't we take the clean team, put that under Sergeant Blanchard, and when he has a problem out there, boom, he can order that clean team in there and we clean it up. The people want to see results. We don't want to get caught up in the bureaucratic maze, and that's what I seem to be seeing here, the bureaucratic maze. We got code enforcement here, we got minimum housing there. Put it all under the police department, 
expedite it, one number, one complainant. You got your sanitation inspector, get out there and, you know, not for, I don't want to tell the war story about there's an apartment on 1865 or 1875 Venice Park Drive. Every day I would walk by that place and I would see the dumpsters overflowing with garbage. And, and I would call and nothing was done. Finally, I signed a complaint against the guy with Mark Haggerty and I took the guy before the Code Enforcement Board, or the, the special master, I beg your pardon. And he finally had to clean it up. But we should apply community-based policing, problem-solving techniques to our code enforcement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Each. I'm Grover Rawlings, 12444 North Bayshore Drive, and this kind of goes along with what Chief Each was just talking about. Uh, it's not an apartment, but uh, I'm becoming very concerned about the deterioration of the White House Inn located at the corner of uh, North Bayshore Drive and 123rd Street. Um, when I first moved into the neighborhood 20-some years ago, my folks had come down and visit, and I'd put them up there. I wouldn't let them pull into the parking lot nowadays. Now, I have a boat, and I uh, exit to the bay along the seaward side, and you can really see the deterioration of that place. I don't know what control we have over it, but uh, two weeks ago I read an uh, article in El Nuevo Herald about uh, some young girl at uh, underage that was uh, being sold into prostitution and caught dancing down at some club nude on South Beach, and this uh, gang of thieves that uh, she was apparently... Uh, uh, the prisoner of we're, we're hanging out at this at this White House Inn, so it's it's really getting bad. Thank you. Thank you. Annie Montgomery, twenty eighty two Laurel Lane. I have a few issues that I would just like addressed. Car repair every weekend in driveways, parking on the lawns, which has been mentioned already, and on swales, and the swales are, that are unkept. We have a noise ordinance, but it's not enforced. We have an ordinance about parking on swales that's not enforced. We have signs all over this town, mattress sales. Now it's the tax season, so you have tax season. They're going to do your taxes all over the city. I don't see it in any other city. That's not enforced. Um, car sales. People are selling cars out of their property. Dade County does have an ordinance, and we did get it. One stopped a few years back because of Dade County's ordinance. But I don't believe we have an ordinance on that. I would like to see that. And noise ordinance. We do have a no noise ordinance. Again, I don't think that's enforced. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. How are you doing? Albert Mendes. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, real quickly, it's just my issue with code, and um, I know a lot of the guys in code, unfortunately, because I work in the city. Um, I may not agree with all the codes, and I paid for some of them. Um, I've actually had them write me tickets so I can pay for them because there's issues, for example, working on Saturday I don't agree with. But I've actually told them, look, I have to pay the fine, I'll pay for it. My issue is that we have a lot of codes that we don't enforce. Um, the grass, whether it be the grass, whether it be the swale, whether it be the noors, there's no enforcement and there's whether it's me that I've lived here 15 years or whether it's someone that's lived here one year I don't think I should get a break nor do I think the person that lives here 20 years should get a break nor do I think the person that lives here one year should get a break um, if we get cited we should fix it or repair it and we have a warning we have a process 10 days whatever it is goes to the magistrate but that doesn't seem to happen it, there's always an extension and there's always a situation where it's just being left up to, well, it's partially fixed. We'll let that go, and we'll see how it looks in a couple of months or a couple of weeks. Um, unfortunately, that's just my issue with the way things are unfortunately being handled. I think if, if we have to abide by them, we should. That's way I think everybody's on an even queue, and things will eventually end up looking better for the city, which is, I guess, why we're all here. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mendez. You. Ms. Marquez.
Hello everyone, I'm Michelle Marquez. I live at 1970 South Hibiscus Drive. Um, so a couple of things that I'd like to speak on uh, regarding code enforcement is kind of a follow-up to Albert's comments regarding actual enforcement. Um, I know my code enforcement officer in my neighborhood pretty well and he's got my email address and he gets he's no longer with us okay great so he doesn't get my emails anymore but um, the one thing that I found is that if there is a, a code enforcement problem and I reach out to code typically I, I would not get a response back um, I would never know what the what the resolution of that code issue was uh, unless I personally saw it for myself. So I think it would be great if code enforcement would actually reach out to the people that do uh, put, put in those requests and tell them you know, what the outcome of that is, what the solution is. Um, regarding some of the code issues, sidewalks for me are a really big issue. Uh, I see people walk on them. I see them push their strollers. Uh, people like to walk hand in hand, side by side in the evenings. I don't know about um, a lot of sidewalks in the downtown area. I know they've been fixed up. They're pavered. They look very nice. But in a lot of the residential areas, I feel like the city kind of says it's all the homeowner's responsibility. Um, and I disagree with that. I think we pay a lot of taxes. And I know that the swale is the city's property. And I think the sidewalk is on the swale. Therefore, I'm pretty sure the sidewalk belongs to the city. And I think they should maintain the sidewalks. Uh, if the city has a code of a four foot wide sidewalk, I think they should ensure that all sidewalks are four feet wide. Uh, if the city, I know that the city right now does not have a specific clearance when it comes to vegetation of code. I know that the code enforcement officer that I worked with told me that it was um, within his realm to decide if a sidewalk was in fact clear or not of vegetation. So if that code enforcement officer is 5'8", and he can walk the sidewalk and he doesn't run into a tree branch, that's okay. But if I'm six feet tall and I walk into a tree branch, I guess that's okay too, according to code. Because uh, it's all his, it was his, um, you know, idea of what he felt was clear. So I think the city should define clearance on the sidewalks so that there's no speculation and there's no one person's um, judgment over what's clear or not. The other thing I think with the sidewalks is I think that there should be some cross compliance with the building and zoning department. If a home is being remodeled, I think it's imperative that that home also, because I believe this is in the code, replace the sidewalks. There are multiple homes in my neighborhood that are being remodeled, yet they do not replace their sidewalk. So at the end of the remodel, they have a beautiful paver driveway. They have a brand new roof and new windows. And the sidewalk has huge gaps, is cracked, is crumbling. It possibly has asphalt to repair, which looks degrading to the neighborhood. So I'd like to see like a cross training with zoning with code, um, you know, just so that those things can be noticed throughout different departments and, and resolved. Uh, let's see. And then the sidewalks kind of bring me to landscaping in general. I think it would be nice. I'm sure the city and its master plan has a design for common space landscaping. Um, and as one of the other neighbors mentioned, I think it would be nice if they kind of institute that plan throughout the entire city. It seems like, you know, things that get dirty, it gets hodgepodgey, um, plants are not replaced when they die, and then the city just looks degraded. So I know that that's a cost. Uh, I know that the CRA has brought in millions and millions and millions of dollars, and a lot of our city is within the boundaries of that CRA, and I think it would be nice if people would work on a landscape design and integrate that throughout the entire city. Uh, let's see. I agree with a gentleman, uh, I believe he was a former mayor, about the apartment buildings. I think I read in the newspaper that one of those apartment buildings had a collapsed roof and many people were displaced. Uh, obviously that's not our 
building and zoning and code enforcement stepping up and making sure that we're safe in our community. So I think we should work on that. Um, possibly rental inspections are a good idea. I don't know. And I believe there was also a conversation uh, with regards to building and zoning and our city's flood insurance. The, our city, I, I believe, receives a special discount, 25% off in flood insurance if all of our remodeled homes are built within code and of the height, the, the level of the new home. If you, if you build outside of the 50% of the value of the structure or the square footage of the structure, you're supposed to raise the structure above floodplain or nine feet or whatever the terminology is. And I believe a lot of homes are getting around that. I don't know if the, the, the city is just not informed about our 25% insurance issue or, or our discount that we get, or if they're just looking the other way, if they're getting paid off, if they're too busy, if there are not enough people in the office to handle the workflow. But the city's going to lose that 25% discount uh, when we get our inspections if too many homes are getting by with not building up. So I guess those are my concerns for code enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know we have more people out there have things to say. Mr. Hindmarsh. May I? Does this work? Yes. May it please the panel. Douglas Hindmarsh. My address is cloaked by statute. I'm on the east side. Some of these comments will not be popular, but they are factual. I'm glad Judge Mills is here. I talked to her before at Griffith. She wants to bring back the Code Enforcement Board. You've heard Mr. McDermott. I also think it's a good idea. I've been an appointee of two mayors, District 1 and 2, for the Code Enforcement Board upon which I sat for over 10 years. I've also been a Dade County hearing officer for three years. I've handled thousands of code enforcement cases, so I know a tad about it. You need to not only bring it back, but you need to establish procedural and substantive process so that there is an election of the peers for the chair. It won't be rocket science for the city attorney to do it. All you have to do, now I understand we call the personnel board, a.k.a. the civil service board by charter, HR, finally, uh, I have an election every time I get a new member. I'm the chair of HR, I guess it is now, the Civil Service Board, the Personnel Board, and have been that for since 2000, whatever that is. Um, I'm getting complaints from clients. Madam Commissioner, you need to hear this. I'm getting complaints from clients. When it comes to diversity, you don't have a code enforcement board they can go to. You can't forum shop for a judge. You're going to get one of four. My understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, one of four Haitian American uh, magistrates. Now, to an average type, Hispanic, I've been told by former HR, there's no Spanish in North Miami. I am surrounded by all the Spanish in North Miami. Uh, whether it be Puerto Rican, Cuban, Dominican, the point being, there are a lot of ethnicities in this city. There's a lot of languages, and we need to have a judicial bank, more than one ethnicity. When it comes to flooding, I have some issues. When it comes to flooding, when you build a new structure, it has to be nine mean feet above sea level. The law of unintended consequences applies here. I live where I live. We now have a million-gallon puddle when it rains on June 2nd and June 16th. The drains are six inches. Uh, City Manager Steve Johnson would not put it on the agenda. My commissioner would not put it on the agenda. Commissioner Carol Keyes holding this forum would not put it on the agenda. It needs to be put on the agenda because when Mr. John Jackson, the building department, issues a permit, the water sheds, if you take a 10,000 square foot lot and put a 6,500 square foot house and you elevate it to nine mean feet above sea level, the runoff is going in the street. It's called sheet water in building terms. I'm also a general contractor. 
The drain down from my street will carry 33,800 gallons an hour. That puddle is a million two. It takes 30 hours to drain. We either need to enhance the drain or, 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 uh, building inspector John Jackson could say, you can build whatever you want, but you are going to engineer it so you will contain the sheet water until it percolates down into the aquifer. Judge Mills, when it comes to uh, shutters, there's already a code. You can put them up three days before, and you have to take them down five days after. And uh, Chief Each, there's already a poop ordinance. Uh, I think it's 432. I don't remember which section it's in. If the dog leaves its mess and the owner walks away, you take a picture, you file an affidavit, you go before the Code Enforcement Board. Now you go before a magistrate, and the fine is $250. Do you have any other comments on code I problems? I do not. Okay. Thank you Appreci for your time. Appreciate Thank you that. for holding this seminar. Appreciate your comments. <clears throat> we have anybody else out there? Good. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Howard Tonkin. I live at 12600 Griffin Boulevard. Um, I'd like to speak, uh, speak on behalf of the trees since they don't have a voice. Um, a big problem is hat racking of trees in North Miami. And um, when you have an ancient uh, gumbo limbo or a live oak and it's uh, either mutilated for development, um, I'm sorry, um, if the tree is hat racked and mutilated for development for putting in of a parking lot, for example, on Dixie Highway, there was a strip mall put in recently uh, next to some couple of hundred, three hundred year old live oak trees. Uh, the live oak trees are now dead, ready to fall over because the parking lot was put in right next to them. I took that today. Okay, this, yeah, well. <laughs> also, the, um, the uh, well, one thing is that uh, FPL, this is a thing with FPL in the city that FPL has control of this and and uh, but what FPL doesn't have control over is you know that if there was a policy um, within the city and code enforcement if there was a policy of perhaps planting endangered species um, we're, at, we're at a time right now in 2014 when much of South Florida is about to go extinct uh, there are many tree species that are extinct in the wild only in people's private collections. This is a reality right now. So we're about to lose a massive amount of spe species, yet North Miami is planting palm trees on 125th Street, cutting them down in to put a sidewalk, and planting palm trees on Griffin Boulevard, planting palm trees all over the place. We don't need any more palm trees. What we need in, in the city is shade trees and the plant of, planting of endangered species because uh, palm trees are certainly not endangered and um, you know it's, it's tropical, we get that. Um, but um, if there could be some sort of enforcement of the hat racking and the cutting down of the ancient trees and perhaps making people plant trees or using the money from the fines for cutting the trees to replace trees. Um, in addition to that, I'd like to mention that um, perhaps the city in a proactive way could take some of the last five or six slash pines in North Miami and create some sort of an historic register. I'm from Australia. In Australia, we don't just have historic buildings. We have historic trees. In that, in that regard, then the trees are protected for all time and eternity, and the property owner who might live in some, uh, you know, falling down house and happens to have a you know 300 year slash pine that's one of five or six trees in the city is then going to have that tree protected and it's going to know what tree that they have because a lot of the, a lot of the problem you know I'm a, I'm a landscaper that works with endangered species a lot of the problem that we have is just pure ignorance to the situation um, so perhaps some proactive education rather than just c reacting in a reactive way with code enforcement perhaps being more proactive and having some kind of an education going in the, on in the community and, and uh, just one more thing, last night I was walking my dog and a branch almost hit me in the face. So I swiped up, you know, so I was like, maybe that's Bougainvillea. I ripped my jacket. And so if there could be some pruning of Bougainvilleas on, on sidewalks, that would be awesome. And uh, just, just the other thing that I wanted to mention is every holiday we have um, jet skis flying up and down the, B the Biscayne River. We live in the city that has one unique thing about it. Miami is the only metropolitan area 
in the world that has a large endangered mammal swimming in its waters. We have manatees and we have a responsibility as we have a large endangered mammal, the only city in the world that can say that. Yet we have jet skis flying up and down our, our rivers. It's, it's breathtaking. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Do we have anybody else? China, thank you. China Lucian, 12880 Griffin. Um, two, two things really. One of them is bulk trash. I don't know what the, the remedy would be with this, but obviously on the weekends is when everybody cleans out their house and cleans out their landscaping. I know all our bulk trash is on Thursday, right? Wednesday. Wednesday. Which means if we're doing all of our landscape pruning and anything we're going to throw out of our house on Saturday, really by law it's not supposed to go to the street. Well, let's face it, everybody puts it out. So that means pretty much for the remainder of the week, it just looks like trash. And our neighborhood is so stunning, it's just a shame. I don't know how to rectify that because obviously that would mean, you know, you, we would have to be upping when bulk trash is picked up. And I don't think that the remedy is, is to enforce it for people not to put it out because when are you going to put it out? You go back to work. We don't get home until 9.30 at night. It's like, you know, it's, we got to figure something out with that. The second thing is I think what you were saying, Councilman Keyes, is having some kind of teeth, but I think we need to be careful. I know often when people in our neighborhood call about things, we're calling about the same things over and over, like the boarded up houses. So I think that we need to empower our code compliance officers to give people an opportunity to do the right thing, but if it has been a certain length of time, like what are the next steps? Can they go to like the next level and then just keep continuing until it's like, okay, we're gonna come and we're gonna take the boards down for you and then we're gonna charge you for it. So I, I, I know that we have Officer Fitzell, which we think is fabulous, by the way. He's great, he really wants to work within our community. Um, he's not trying to you know, drag anybody like through the mud if they can't get it together, because we're still in tough economic times and I want us to all be careful about that. Um, you know, people don't necessarily have the money right away to paint their house or fix their soil or whatever it is, but of course we all want to do the right thing to beautify our communities, but we need to give these officers, like, the teeth to be able to take things to the next level, keeping, um, kind of not throwing people under the bus, so to speak. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have anybody else that would like to say anything? Just one thing. Uh, abandoned buildings. Like the, uh, you, you have to speak into the uh, microphone, Chief. One, one of the things that I, that I see in the city is the abandoned buildings, like the one on um, San Susi Boulevard. I don't know if that deal fell through or not in Biscayne Boulevard. That should have come down years ago. It's an eyesore. The other one's on 6th Avenue and 122nd Street Northeast. Caught on fire a few years ago. We were going to give them money from the CRA, and uh, the guy's never done anything with it. It's just it's absolutely terrible. Thank you. Ms. Burdick, thank you for coming up. Hi. Ilana Burdick, 13502 Northeast 24th Place. That is my, as a resident, but I also am a landlord. And I think, I hear I'm a good landlord. I don't want to be lumped into the consequences of paying extra money to have inspections that, the, that is caused by the, the slum landlords. My family takes pride in the way we run our building, the way we run our houses. I would live in any one of them and people come and love our building. I've had inspections in the building from building inspectors and they are amazed at how well we keep the building. Rental inspections not only adds more expense to me as a landlord, but it also is an imposition upon the tenants that live there. Also, I've noticed that there's been inspections that have been duplicating what other cities do. And it's a new year. I know I'm going to be open to a lot of inspections. But if I have the fire department come through, I don't need another department coming through doing the same thing that they're doing. 
it's extra money out of, uh, that I have to spend, and it's time use that should have been, the employee could be used doing something else. And what I'm hearing a lot of is that there is, and when I used to sit on the code enforcement board, I think the biggest thing that bothered a lot of us, and the code enforcement officers also, is the fact that there was no teeth in the law, no tooth, no bite, no consequence, no enforcement. Um, being a private citizen and a landlord, I'd sit up there and I'd hear cases and I know what things cost and how how ridiculously cheap it would have been for the landlord to fix something as opposed to the fine that we now had to impose upon them. It didn't make sense. It's just that they didn't want to do it. Education is another big part. The welcome packets used to be way, way back. We need them. I, I talk to people on my street all the time, but I can't be the only one trying to educate my new neighbors that come in and out of a neighborhood. So it's, it's the education, it's the duplicate inspections, it's the influence of the code enforcement laws that we need to strengthen. And, um, and I'm a little bit leery about some of the things. I'm going to have to go read now what you were telling me yes. so that I can write more to you or whoever because I'm already drowning under paperwork. My, my staff is me, myself, and I. I don't have a large staff in my building. So I have to do it all. And if I'm going to be heaped with more stuff on here, it's going to make it impossible. Absolutely impossible. The water's another issue. All these things, it's, it's going to be who's going to want to do business anymore. It's not going to be worth it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ritter. Madam Commissioner? Yes? If I may. Take another minute. Okay. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. What I wanted to say, Madam Commissioner, uh, this whole, the spirit of this whole thing should be compliance with the building code. Not, code enforcement should not be used, and I've seen it used, as a political weapon. Uranium's good, but you can enrich it and weaponize it, make nuclear bombs. Code enforcement's not supposed to be used for that. It's health safety, welfare, and compliance with the building code so that we don't have roofs zinging around in the middle of hurricanes or shutters coming off transecting people at the waist. So since we're doing a workshop, please let us not lose sight of the spirit of code compliance is to comply with the building code. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody from the public who wants, hasn't spoken? Uh, Councilwoman Sterrell? Or Councilman Bienname, would you like to say something? No, you're just. I'm here to listen and observe. Pardon me? I'm here to listen and observe. Okay, thank you. Is anybody else going to um, want to speak? Um, as a citizen, I, I thank everybody for um, a lot of different ideas, things we haven't discussed, things we haven't talked about. Um, a few of the items that I feel strongly about that I will let you know that I don't want to duplicate. Um, is number one, there's been a, an excellent handout put out by our code enforcement, questions and answers, and very informative, so please take one of those home, scan it, stick it in your computer, and keep it. Um, we do have a big need for code enforcement in our apartment buildings. Uh, since we wrote, finalized our minimum housing code in December, two days later, the first roof collapsed. A few weeks later, a um, that was a ceiling fell on somebody's head. Uh, a few weeks later, a roof collapsed at a different apartment building, uh, displaced 250 people for a few weeks. Um, that, w that was a mistake. Uh, it wasn't necessary code compliance. I don't know if that's something the city could have prevented with inspections. But just two weeks ago, another roof collapsed, and that could have been prevented had we been able to go in there and inspect. So there are a lot of problems. Um, some of these apartment buildings are, as uh, Chief Each has said, they, they really need inspections. That being said, we, we have so many different inspections, as Ms. Burdick said. Uh, we've got certificate of use inspections and building um, fire inspections, which is probably a different department, but we do need to be mindful of the 
owners and not make it too onerous with all these different licenses, inspections. Uh, other things that bother me, my pet peeves are, and I believe we did an ordinance, but soliciting, putting cards on your cars, I think that is littering. I think we have a ordinance we finally did, but it's not being enforced. Every day I come out to my car in my parking lot and there is cards, menus, stuff that I do not want, and this is litter, and I think this is something we should be enforcing. We've got pods all over the city. Uh, I know they're supposed to be permitted, but they're not being permitted. They are pods, once you permit it, you're allowed 30 days. Uh, these pods are sitting out in front of people's homes. There are requirements. Uh, that needs some enforcement. I think we need code enforcement in our canals. I something I want to discuss with code enforcement to make sure that we do have a code enforcement officer that does patrol the canals. Uh, you can have just as much um, as many code infractions on the canals. Biscayne River Canal, you have talked about speeding. Make sure we have the speed limits. Uh, make sure we are taking care of our animals and make sure we're taking care of our water, uh, not throwing things in there. We have a tremendous, um, tremendous problem right now with short-term rental, which we've been dealing with lately. Uh, if you don't think so, just have, you know, massive parties every day next door to you. Look at the um, flyers, go to the Internet, and you'll see that homes in our city are being advertised for rent by the day and week for corporate gatherings. If you look at the blogs, people are saying how wonderful it was to spend a week in, um, in this home and that we do have laws. We need to enforce those. We have derelict vehicles. Uh, derelict vehicle have been sitting in Keystone Point on our main entrance. Uh, these cars have not moved for three years, and they get around it by having covers, but these covers are not there. These cars don't even have license tags on them. So we need to enforce derelict vehicles and where they're parking. Uh, I think we're going to have to have a discussion on swales, swale maintenance, whether we can park on swales or not. If you keep the swales uh, maintained, maybe you know people do need a place to park. Um, but it's something to discuss. A lot of people have parked in their yards, which is not allowed. But we have to be able to enforce this. Uh, garbage and bulk trash, we do have to think of people putting their bulk out a day or two early. And going with that, we have illegal dumping throughout the city. I think this is a citywide problem. We have a great city. We have weekly bulk pickup. The rest of the county does not. They have once a month, if that. And people are coming into our city, and they are dumping their garbage and trash even a week early. So we've seen uh, construction refuse dumped on a Saturday when the bulk pickup is not till Friday. Uh, one week it was just impossible. So that's something, again, you've got the code enforcement hotline. If you see this, call the police, call code, and they will come out. Um, we, again, we need more teeth. We need to get our code enforcement to be a cohesive department so someone can call and know that it will be taken care of. The citizens need to know where to, where to go and how to follow up. And lastly, we did have a conversation about floodplain. Uh, this was brought up at a homeowners association, and it appears that many of the houses, this is not necessarily code compliance, but several of the houses are being rebuilt more than 50% and are coming in with figures that just seem impossible. Uh, we've spent many years, I've been on the floodplain committee for about a dozen years, and we've gotten one of the highest ratings in the country where the houses throughout North Miami in the floodplain are getting a 25% uh, discount. And the, we have flood the entire city, not just on the water, and we've got to make sure that we are uh, complying with these FEMA guidelines. Uh, that being said, we are listening. Thank you for coming and uh, we're taking notes and hope Hopefully we can um, do this. We don't want to be a police state, but we do want to protect our citizens. So thank you. And thank you, uh, st staff, for being here, taking a, the evening to come hear our concerns.